Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you guys for the invitation. And Chris, I'll begin by echoing what you said. This really is a race. It's a race against time. It's a race for pain patients. And I think we're not doing a great job. And I think uh, the human aspect, the translational aspect is critical in this process. So I'll tell you a story that a lot of you, it's almost daunting to talk to some of you who've been in this field for a long time, much longer than I have, but I'll try my best. So 1.7 is the target I'm, I'm going to tell you about today. It's been a dismal failure, and I'll walk through some of the reasons for the failure. I'm sure there's a lot more. And then I'll navigate to how we in academia in my lab and in the company have tried to navigate and sort of circumvent the direct antagonism of 1.7. So it's a, it's a long tale. Please stick with me. It's going to take a little bit of time. All right. So. There have been a lot of talks before me, so I'll go through these pretty fast. Pain's a big problem. It, it's a global problem, and you can see that patients wait for over seven years or so to really get any kind of pain relief. And um, not every patient really gets equivalent pain relief. This is ex exacerbated by what was uh, discussed earlier, by the fact that pain is not just 10 or 12 conditions, it's over hundreds of different <coughs> conditions that form a constellation of pain. And this cartoon from uh, Aptiva Therapeutics really sort of highlights that pain is not what's shown up here, which is a small, maybe 10, 12 uh, pain conditions for which there are regulatory guidance, but it's actually what's in the bottom left corner of the slide, which is really a smorgasbord, if you will, of many, many different diseases for which there's not clear regulatory guidance. And this is because pain is a constellation of diseases, as we've heard from various speakers this morning and afternoon. And therein lies the problem that in order to combat this constellation, there's really no magic bullet, at, or it's, so it seems. And there have been many targets that have been identified, Dr. Ivan Eisenbaum uh, articulated some of the targets that are FDA approved. <coughs> But, but there are a lot of clinical failures. Um, at the North American Pain School over the last summer, um, uh, Dr. Jeff Mogul, the former director of the Ellen Edwards Center for Pain Research in McGill, um, pontificated on some of these targets that have failed. And I will tell you about one such target, which a lot of you know about um, probably in great detail. And this is the NAD 1.7 channel, the sodium channel 1.7. But before I do, this is not all a pain audience, but I'm glad to see this. there's a lot of pain people. Uh, we'll begin with a very, very, very quick overview uh, of what pain is all about at a very simple level. It begins in the periphery. I'm glad to see a lot of peripherals here. Um, a pain signal has to be transmitted, and this is really in the form of an action potential, which is conveyed through the dorsal ganglia and, and the, the nose receptors that are housed here. These nociceptors, of course, express critical ion channels, including voltage-gated sodium channels, which are really responsible for coordinating the excitability, the transmitter release, and then the net effect that is the nociceptin or pain behaviors. But of course, things are always more, more complicated, and really, the, there are at least five different ion sodium channels, voltage-gated sodium channels, in the sensory neuron, in the DRGs. These are cartooned here, and it's very clear that NAD 1.7, shown in purple, really is critical, because without this, you cannot get an action potential. So it really is critical for the rising phase of the action potential and amplifies these subthreshold stimuli. Put it in a very different way, here's Jimi Hendrix playing his guitar. The guitar he's strumming with his teeth. That's 1.7. The big amplifier next to him is 1.8. And so that carries the bulk of the action potential, but without him strumming and, and really teasing out 1.7, uh, nothing will happen. So really, 1.7 is the volume knob for node receptors, and we really need to stop pain at this particular target. This really, the field was really galvanized by discoveries 20, 25 years ago, which really showed that <coughs> there are defined mutations at that cause both gain of function and loss of function. The, the, these are shown here that allow excessive amounts of, of sodium ions to come through, which leads to excessive pain disorders. And conversely, the con congenital insensitivity to pain, which have mutations that cause complete loss of pain. And this is an example of cortical responses in these, CIP patient, in these CIP patients, the capsaicin, 
which nothing lights up or healthy controls have a uh, bona fide response. 1,7 is very important, as you can see that it, it's a large fraction of small sensory neurons. It's present in the periphery, in the skin terminals, as well as in nociceptors, as well as in the spinal cord. And really, recent data is emerging that one of the reasons for the failures, and I'll expound on some, several of them, is our unappreciation, <coughs> our, our, our novel appreciation of the fact that they are important in central terminals. Uh, Price's uh, group has a bioarchive paper that shows very clearly in these beautiful uh, images that NAD1.7 protein is expressed in the lumbar uh, cord and in spinal dorsal horn, but also in places that it's perhaps not been appreciated in, in the anterior commissure. It's present in postsynaptic regions, and some of those are being functionally evaluated, and I believe those are some of the reasons why this drug, this, this target is failing. And you'll hear more about this from Ted tomorrow. So with the idea that this channel is really important, it's been clinically validated, a lot of effort and, and ph uh, pharma and academia have spent in designing drugs against these small molecules were designed. Picomolar sensitive compounds were developed by Genentech. Um, there's some examples of crystallography efforts showing some of these compounds. And Unfortunately, there have been clinical failures of direct antagonism of this compound, including some of the Biogen compounds, as, as well as some of the Pfizer compounds listed here. Um, in the next few slides, I'll tell you why, at least some of the reasons of why this has failed. So the first reason for this loss, loss of translation is, is the fact that there's multiple channels for which we have to overcome uh, the selectivity, selectivity hurdle. So for example, this uh, Pfizer compound, the <coughs> clinical candidate, um, blocks TTF-sensitive channels, including NAV1.7, but human DRG work revealed, uh, from Birgit Priest and Mike Gold, revealed that not only does it block TTF-sensitive, but also blocks TTF-resistant, which is 1.8 and 1.9. So clearly there's something amiss, uh, and we really need to translate some of these discoveries in humans before we take them to <coughs> clinical trials. A second reason, and that's really gaining notoriety recently, is the fact that there is a central component. I know I'm a peripheralist, I know some other peripherals here, but there is a central component I think we're missing here. And evidence for that comes from studies where mice have been developed for this particular channel, and in particular these mice have an altered pain sensitivity, reduced pain sensitivity. And if you look at uh, um, some of the critical events and neurotransmitter release in this particular mice, you see that what the knockout mice require increased stimulations to elicit the same amount of neurotransmitter release in the spinal cord uh, compared to uh, wild-type mice. If you take this one step further, this really implies that there's a reduction in the presynaptic release or the sensitivity in these knockout mice. What this collectively means is that there is a central component of NAD1.7 which has not perhaps been targeted with past approaches. Uh, recent ev evidence also suggests that there's a lack of endogenous opioid regulation, although this theory has been recently debunked in a beautiful paper, uh, which perhaps Ted will talk about tomorrow. And, and this is coming from experiments from John Woods Group at UCL, where they've used different versions of uh, antagonists for the naloxone, for uh, using different naloxone uh, variants to tease out a, a central versus peripheral component. And what they find is that if you have 1.7 knockout mice and you give them naloxone, which is an opioid receptor antagonist, you can reverse analgesia imposed by loss of one cell. And this is through the uh, centrally acting, but if you give this peripherally, now you don't see that effect. Again, implying that there is a central component of targeting 1.7 that's perhaps being missed. So a fourth reason uh, is that uh, because we're on, uh, Ion channel, this is an ion channel, and really the holy grail will be to develop a state-selected blocker. And that's a great uh, thing to do. Pfizer developed one. Uh, here's an example of this of a Pfizer compound, which really uh, is similar in all cases, except when you mutate the channel to lose its voltage-sensing apparatus. You can do this using a plasmid, or you can artificially change the channel's conduction stage and move it either into resting state or inactivating state, state, and you can see there's a clear difference. In other words, implying that there is a way to develop state-dependent blockers. 
But whether this translates into humans and what state the human channels are is not known. So this is something that we need to still uh, get our heads around. Uh, finally, one of the reasons could be poor pharmacokinetic properties. Some of the, the compounds uh, uh, that have been used in the past have, been, uh, have failed because of orthostatic hypotension and probably because of their poor uh, PK properties. Aerosulfonamides need a much higher amount of, they, they exhibit a lot of plasma binding, so that means they need much higher concentrations to require analgesia. This is solvable and you can optimize and make acyl sulfonamides, which can be affected at much lower concentration. So this gives the idea that, that with the right amount of SAR strategies, you can make the compounds better. And there are many, many other reasons which I'll not expound on. Um, and I'll say, I'll move on to what I want to talk about, talk about, which is to move into our strategy. So our strategy was to not take this direct block approach, but to go into a, a way to do an indirect uh, block by asking the question, can we indirectly regulate the channel? And we looked at the sort of the crowded interactome of NAB 1.7 channel and to see which protein could affect the activity of this particular channel. And we found a particular protein called uh, CRIMP2, collapsin response mediated protein, I'll refer to it as CRIMP2. It's a cytosolic uh, protein, it's a phosphoprotein, heavily modified, and really its, it's claim or most important function was to really regulate exonal guidance, in particular microtubule elongation and neural outgrowth. In the past 10 to 15 years, my lab has revealed novel roles for this particular protein in the context of its trafficking of ion channels, and this is the story I'll tell you for the rest of the talk. So first thing we did is to ask the question, does this channel interact with CRIM2? It does, using immunoprecipitation experiments. But importantly, what we did next is to interrogate this functional, uh, to test if this was functional. And here, I'm showing the recordings from sensory neurons, the red neurons in this particular case, um, beautiful TTF-sensitive currents shown here in black. If you delete the channel using an sRNA approach, uh, if you delete CRIM2 using an sRNA approach, you now see a, a nice reduction in the current. This is not seen in the TTX resistant fraction. If you add back this CRIM2 protein, you can recover fully the loss of current, showing that deletion of this particular protein was sufficient to confer regulation of this particular channel. Well, as I told you, CRIMP is a very multifunctional protein, and it is heavily modified. So these are some of the modifications that happen, a lot of different kinases. My lab uh, identified a small ubiquitin-like modifier modification on this particular protein. In collaboration with my wife's group, we solved the crystal structure of this protein and realized that a particular lysine was the subject of this simulation of, of uh, added to CRIM2. And essentially, this was the, the lysine, the 374. And in, in contrast to what we did earlier, which is to delete CRIM2, here all we're doing is simply mutating this particular lysine to, so that CRIM2 is no longer simulated. And when we did this, we saw the exact same decrement in current density. So this is promising. A single mutation of a regulatory protein was enough to convert this regulation. <coughs> and this is pretty exciting because as we've been talking about biomarkers, in collaboration with Aaron Young's group in Kansas University, we've been starting to understand that there's SNPs against this CRIM2 lysine to arginine or lysine to alanine mutation that is present. And we're now trying to explore whether this would be higher in humans with chronic pain. So we're looking, we're still pursuing that. But to take this story further, so loss of CRIM2 stimulation is important to, to confer this regulation. So we probe this further to see if this was specific, because I told you this was a big problem in, in, in targeting this channel. So if we look at, if we look at TTS sensitive <coughs> currents in, in sensory neurons with Wild type CRIM2, we have normal currents. In a sumonal plasmid carrying sensory neuron, we have similar currents. If we move over to this side, and to the middle, in the TTX sensitive currents are made up of 1, 1, 1, 6, 1, 7. Now, if we look at the cells that express this plasmid that's non simulatable for CRIM2, we see a reduction. So, is that because of 1, 7? We probe that further by Removing 1,7 out of the equation with protox, which is a sort of a thing of bring toxin, and now you see the currents are the same. So by inference, the regulation upon loss of CRIM2 stimulation is only because of 1,7. And it's because of trafficking of 1,7. These are self transfected with wild type CRIM2, showing an annular surface expression, whereas some subsumonal uh, cells have a loss of this surface expression. 
And uh, very early on, we were adopters of the antibiotics technology, and we have obtained uh, DRGs from them, and we translated this discovery from uh, rats and mice into humans. Here we have examples of these beautiful cells that were actually flown to us when we, my group was in Arizona. From San Diego, somebody would come in with a plexiglass container, and uh, cells were great. We would do everything on these cells that you could think of. Patch them, do calcium imaging, do some RNA-C, everything you could think of. So, um, so th these, these, these cells really helped us validate so, uh, the, the discoveries I've told you in the past. So these are not the prettiest currents, but very robust, massive currents, certain currents in wild-type cryptoexpressin cells and much smaller currents in the 374A Zumonel currents. If you only look at the TTF-sensitive, again, you see, uh, of which 1.7 is a part of, you see massive reduction. So these, cell, these studies in human DRGs really helped us de-risk the mechanism, de-risk uh, our, our mechanism and really validate the mechanism from rodents to humans. Uh, we probed this further and saw that the modifications of CRIM2 didn't really change the biophysical properties of fast inactivation, activation, as well as uh, use dependence. Okay, so building on this, we took it further, developed, uh, uh, asked the question if we can develop this into a mouse. We developed a transgenic mouse with CRISPR-Cas technologies, and uh, suffice to say, uh, it, what we showed first is that the CRIM2 itself is not uh, simulated. This is approximately a ligation assay where you should see a red dot appear when the two proteins are within 10 and 30 nanometers of each other. And probably can't see here, but I can see it on my screen. There are no red dots in, in male and female uh, DRGs from these simulated mice. Excitingly, functionally, we saw what we saw before in the slides I've shown you, which is that loss of stimulation was, was sufficient to confer this regulation or loss on this, uh, of, the, of the channel. And this was because of an effect on trafficking. So the system and the mechanism holds. Most excitingly, when we took these animals and now inflicted upon them different models uh, of injury, in this particular case we did an SNI injury uh, uh, to inflict, uh, to bring about a pain, sort of a neuropathic pain model, we now saw something pretty amazing, which was both in females and males, we saw that these animals didn't develop the extent of pain-like behaviors, but then over the course of the experiments, uh, within 30 days, they fully recovered to control uh, like animals, uh, to, to, to basically uh, naive animals. And uh, wild-type animals have consistent pain throughout the course of this. So this really galvanized, it really fir you know, firmed up in our minds that this mechanism was really holding true. <coughs> Taking this further and putting it all together, now we ask the question uh, of whether we can develop a small molecule to take this further. And uh, with this, we developed a company or set up a company called Regulonics, Regulators of Ion Channels, to, with the mission statements shown here. And our mission really was to be different from the competitors, which is the approach that's been applied so, uh, so far has been to really directly block the channel. Our approach, as I've shown you, is to understand the molecular conversation of this particular protein with what's happening in the intracellular review, in particular the CRIM2. We understood that a protein called UBC9 brought SUMO to CRIM2, and by blocking that, if we could develop a small molecules, we could revert that to a no pain scenario or a reduction in pain. And this is the approach we took. We embarked on a historical campaign, docked uh, not a large number of compounds, docked compounds to the lysine site of simulation within CRIM2 and uh, basically came with a compound called 194. I'll show you a little animation. Uh, this is a compound falling into the crevice between UBC9, the enzyme that brings SUMO onto CRIM2. You'll see it zoomed in and then you see a molecular dynamics simulation of about 20 nanoseconds which essentially shows that the compound is extremely stable and is able to prevent the simulation of CRIM2. So this is our lead compound, at least it was a few years ago. Um, uh, I'll tell you very quickly that this compound is selective. We tested it in small DRGs, and you can see inhibition by our compound. If you block uh, with Protox, you can also see a nice inhibition. But if you combine our compound 194 with Protox, you don't see a further inhibition, meaning that this compound 194 really regulates all of 17 in these sensory neurons. It does so in small DRGs, but not in large DRGs, and it's, it's specific only for 1.7. It doesn't hit any of the other channels, nor does it hit uh, CAV 2.2. Uh, 
Importantly, this translates across species. It works the same in mice, in, in pigs, and importantly, again, in DRGs obtained virgins from antibiotics, we saw a reduction in human uh, 1.7 upon this regulation strategy by blocking CRIM2 simulation by 194. And finally, uh, to close the mechanism, because we had made that mouse, which doesn't have CRIM2 simulation, which has a reduction in currents, we again patch those cells, you see the reduction in current, the white bars, but now if we give this, these sensory neurons 194, there's no simulation, so there's no control and regulation of 1.7, and we see no effect. So this is what we see here. So that really closes the loop on the mechanism. Moving onwards, uh, we showed that if we take spinal cord uh, slices, we can see a reduction in the frequency uh, and the number of action potentials with this compound. And hopefully we'll see some beautiful work from Michael Hildebrandt, where he's doing work, uh, and, and Anne-Marie Didet, to, to use human, human slice, uh, spinal cord slices. And we hope to collaborate with them uh, to move this uh, 194 into the human DRGs. And finally, I'll tell you that 194 has now, so I've, told you, I've shown you the mechanism in, in sensory neurons, in human DRG neurons, in spinal cord slices. What about in, in actual animals? Uh, so we surveyed a lot of different uh, behavioral models. And we, for example, in, in, in the left panel, we have SNI, where we gave animals intrathecally, uh, and we saw a nice pain relief. We saw uh, in SNL, also now given orally, uh, sort of a dose-dependent uh, decrease in, in or relief of pain. Interestingly, we saw when we gave the compound uh, in the paw, we don't see any pain relief. So this, again, implies that there's some sort of a central mechanism that needs to be hit for this to be effective. This compound was tested in models of paclitaxel in our lab, in labs in St. Louis and Dr. Salvini's group, and it's effective in models of formalin, post-surgical pain, itch, as well as a CCI model performed in Peter Grace's lab in MD Anderson Institute, using both evoked and non-evoked measures of pain. I will tell you that we've surveyed this uh, for non-pain behavior, so look at locomotion, exploratory behavior, anxiety, depression, and the, the patients with CIP that have a loss of uh, pain have anosmia, so we, of course, tested for that, and none of these assays, uh, 194, has an effect. This compound has now uh, gone for worldwide authentication in some of the labs across the globe to really increase rigor and reproducibility of some of our studies and, and to take this compound further. I will tell you, addressing one aspect of this failure to replicate, which is plaguing our field, is um, is, is, I'm glad and happy to report that this was taken, our compound and our program was taken up by NCATS a few years ago, and they have validated our compound in, in their hands, independent of, of, of us, in nociceptors, in rat DRGs, so in human nociceptors, in nat rat DRGs, in the cell lines, and then independently in uh, Professor Al George's group in Northwestern, uh, using high throughput approach, this compound has also been tested and validated. For the MedCam people and the aficionados, I'll just give you a high-level summary. NCATS has done something we couldn't do, which is to create close to 400 derivatives of this compound and has come up with a, a, a clinical lead candidate with some amazing properties that are listed uh, here. And because I'm running late, I will tell you that what I've shown you very quickly is that we have come at looking at 1.7 from a very dis different perspective. We still f feel that we don't know enough about the biology of 1.7. You see some of the work that's coming out of Ted Price's lab, for example, <coughs> showing this central expression of 1.7. Uh, 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 groups like John Wood have really given functional uh, evidence and backing to the, the, the findings that Ted's group has found. And some of our work also shows that this mechanism is very differentiated but engages a central component. So I've shown you by understanding um, the mechanism of how a regulatory protein can regulate this channel, we've developed small molecules to inhibit this sort of indirect manner. We know this compound, 194 or BPPI, relieves pain in multiple models orally. It transcends different species and particularly is very effective in humans. It's not addictive. What I haven't shown you is it synergizes with other molecules, uh, other, uh, other analgesics, and that's something we're exploring to, to see if that could be a way to, 
take this to the clinic. And the other thing I'll tell you is 194, because of these gain of functions, rare disease mutations, we're now trying to figure out if we could have that as a route to take 194 or one of its cousins developed by one, and then cats to move forward. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, tell you my acknowledgement slides. It's what, some of the work's been done by these amazing postdoctoral fellows. I'm just a spokesperson and a uh, long time collaboration with my wife's group, who's a crystallographer, who's helped us and really uh, develop and take this uh, mechanism-based discovery and develop compounds and so forth. So with that, I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Really nice story and quite exciting um, for the field, obviously. Uh, at the outset, you listed uh, a number of shortcomings of previously evaluated uh, NAD 1.7 ligands, um, many or most of which uh, seemed overcomable, as, as you've shown here, uh, with the notable exception of orthostatic hypotension and potentially other on target side effects. I was wondering if you could talk about that a little more, particularly in the context of the CRIMP2 story? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, obviously there's much, many more, uh, you know, fallacies of these, targeting these compounds. So orthostatic hypotension is one of them. But I, I, I agree with you. I think they perhaps threw the baby with the bathwater too early. I think some of the compounds could have been optimized further. We have not seen any effects on orthostatic hypotension. Our clinical need lead is ready, but we're not in humans yet. So at least in all the rodent models, we've done some non-human primate work at the DRG level. We see the same mechanism of apply. But in both mice, uh, in rats, and in pigs, we don't see any hemostatic effects. We don't see any orthostatic hypotension. But obviously, the, the physiology is so different that I would be, uh, it would be too premature to conclude that. But that's something we're looking into. Uh, for, for our compound? Or for some of the other ones? I think the biggest ones are, well, you know, somebody had said different, wrong gene or different cell. Look, understanding the mechanism of what, what CRIM2 is doing to really figure out whether it's not working, it, it may have some side effects. For example, we tested it in nodose ganglia, and we found something very different. Um, in nodose ganglia, which is important to, for example, for cough, we didn't see this regulation happen. And so we probed that further, and the reason for that essentially was that one of the, uh, the, the regulatory machineries is absent. When we added back that machinery, now we saw that the 194 compound and this vis-a-vis -vis the CRIM2 simulation was now back on. So, so I think going forward, looking at side effects and some of the on and off target effects, we really have to focus it based on what CRIMP is doing. It has some critical function in neurite outgrowth, which are not affected by one, our, our strategy. So I think we have to focus more on, on those than compare our compounds to what's been published before. Our compounds are very different from the compounds before. Thank you. Hi, lovely talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, now what's the, oh, <laughs> Does, uh, it looked like all of the behavioral efficacy you saw was with intrathecal as opposed to peripheral application. Did, did I read that correctly? There are examples of both intrathecal and oral. So we do have oral delivery that is quite efficacious. But again, the, half, the, the timing is about three, three and a half, four hours, which is why we, and cats took it, developed, and now we have a much longer efficacy. Okay, but nothing if you inject it peripherally. So nothing, but we've only done that in one model and in, in, in so SNI or SNL, SNI, and we did it uh, in the paw and we saw nothing. So. And we have some evidence of the opioid upregulation hypothesis that came out of at least John Wood's group and others. But that's been sort of debunked by another group that published a paper that shows that if you knock it out and see LTMRs, you see no uh, evidence of opioid engagement. So, so we're just still looking into that. So have you ever tried ICV? Um, we are trying that right now. And we're, so we're trying true routes right now, ICV and intranasal. So I'll let you know soon. Very good. Uh, thank you. Back there. 
very quick question, please, Boris. Yeah, thank you. Uh, nice talk. Uh, in terms of simulation, uh, it's a phenomenon that uh, basically is seen with a number of proteins. And I'm just wondering, in terms of your structural analysis, you showed the docking of the molecule. What's so special about 1.7 that uh, your inhibitor is not going to be uh, broad-based uh, in terms of the other proteins that are simulated? Thank you for that question. Excellent. Um, so uh, you're absolutely right. Simulation happens on thousands of proteins, hundreds of thousands. So uh, I just want to make sure that, to tell you that 1.7 is not being simulated. It's CRIM2 that's being simulated. And what's so special about that pocket is that, so that pocket is unique for the simulation. So 194 only blocks simulation of CRIM2. We've tested a few other proteins that are simulated, for example, CDK5 it's not affected. We've done some experimental and some computational. Obviously, we've not tested all 1,000 proteins to see if their simulation is affected. But the fact that we've, when we give the animal copious amounts of this compound daily, repeatedly, we don't see the animal having any, any side effects. We, we assume, uh, or at least can say safely, that even if simulation of something else is being affected, it's not to be the detriment of the animal. The one thing I will tell you is one of our first cutoffs in designing this molecule was to make sure that UBC9, which is the enzyme that simulates, brings, is a ligase that helps to simulate everything, it was not touched. If our compound, XYZ, would hit 194, it was thrown out. So we have a nice triage step to make sure that we are not willy-nilly simulating everything. So that's really the why I think we're specific. And we, in, in hindsight, we've done some structural work to make sure that our pocket that's simulated is very different from all the other pockets of known proteins. Uh, sorry. Uh, we, real quick question. So is it, uh, I'm sure the initial chemistry, is it a flat molecule, or does it have some three-dimensionality? Uh, if you saw that, the molecular dynamics, it's a pretty, not, not a flat molecule. It has some three-dimensionality. Three and we're taking advantage of the molecular dynamics to now build in even more to get more into the groove to really lock it in tight. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, <laughs>